Very good. Uh, look, uh, thank you very much, uh, Hunter, for the introduction and a very good afternoon if you're in my part of the world or a good morning uh, close by or certainly a good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. It's certainly great uh, to have your company. Thanks very much uh, for taking some time out of your schedule uh, to come into the webinar today with Metastock and have a listen to some of the things that I'd like to share with you today. I certainly hope I don't waste your time and uh, can give you some of the ideas that I try to incorporate in my own analysis and obviously execution and uh, looking at what I'm looking for with my trades. Uh, as Hunter has already said, uh, with the questions, I certainly always encourage, encourage people to ask questions about anything that I'm speaking about. <clears throat> So obviously, please feel free uh, to do that during the session. And if I don't catch it uh, during the session, I'll certainly towards the end just perhaps catch up on some of those questions and do my very best uh, to respond to those, to answer those. Look, I uh, often do a lot of presentations, uh, normally live at the occasional webinar, and I certainly enjoy standing in front of people and talking. And one of the things that I often open with, and I'd like to just quickly open with it uh, during this session, is I, I quickly talk about my relationship with my children and I have three girls and how I started to hate one word that they would use all the time and the typical conversation of a day would be how was school today and of course all I heard was good and it was how was training this afternoon with your basketball, oh good, how was Dan's good. So I started preventing, I said you're not allowed to use the word good anymore and of course they started using the word fine, how was school today, fine, I thought this is not getting me anywhere, I need to have a di different system. So I decided to introduce a system in conversation with my children where I would have a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being nothing and 10 being the maximum and now as a matter of how much would you like to do this activity and rather than using their words, I can relate to numbers very well and now they can give me much more of an accurate scale. So leading from that story, I then talk to my audience and I say, think about your satisfaction level with your current trading activities. You know, uh, how satisfied are you with, you know, the performance, the results, the comfort, the risk you're taking, everything, everything to do with your trading, how comfortable are you? and think of it on a scale of 0 to 10. I think about that for a second and of course I then say is anybody a 10, you know, put your hand up. And of course, you know, there might be 50 people or 100 people and very rarely, occasionally I'll get one person stick a hand up for a 10, but of course most people don't. I say how about a 0 and of course there's no one. How about a 5 or a 6? And then all of a sudden I have half the room put their hand up. So all of a sudden I've captured that a fair percentage of my audience are right in the middle of the road of sort of satisfaction level with their trading. And it often comes down to expectations and what they come into trading thinking they can achieve and, and sort of their goals they set and their expectations for trading but of course along the journey they consistently fail to meet those expectations. Often those expectations can be a little bit out of reach and unrealistic but I think over time we manage those a little bit and perhaps just reel them in as well as we start to learn a little bit more how difficult trading really is and it's not as easy as we thought it was going to be. So I then talk about this 6 or 5 ranking and how do we get it more to a 8 or a 9 or a 10. There's a gap there and I refer to that as an execution gap. Um, many people identify this gap because they are clearly not meeting their expectations and there's a, a level of dissatisfaction of course if they've rated themselves as a five. So they then try to address this gap which is great, they're trying to, you know, they've identified the gap, they're trying to do the right thing and address but often it boils down to look I, I understand technical analysis, it resonates with me, I'm going to learn more about technical analysis and learn more about uh, techniques and the like. And here is a theory that I have and I'm, I'm confident there'd be many people who disagree with me. But I think for a lot of people traders actually know too much in terms of technical analysis. I think they know too much. They know every single chart pattern that's ever existed. Uh, they know all sorts of things about cycles and waves and lines and levels and everything. They know so much about technical analysis. The problem is 
they try to squeeze all of that knowledge into a simple, robust, easily executable trading strategy or plan. That's the problem, they try to squeeze too much in. And what then happens is because they understand a particular technique uh, of technical analysis, a particular chart pattern, and all the examples they look at all make sense and they're all you know, highly effective and you know, when this particular chart pattern forms, price often does this. Because they've seen all this, they are very reluctant to eliminate that and discount that particular technique. They feel they need to use that in their strategy somehow. And the problem is we now have too many techniques and we're all trying to squeeze it into a relatively straightforward, robust, simple strategy. That's an issue, that's a problem. Because we've gone to so much effort of learning things and now we need to almost have a, a process of actually removing things from our knowledge base and actually trying to squeeze and narrow down. So that's a bit of a problem as well. So one of my core trading beliefs, and it has been this for a very, very long time, and uh, anybody who has purchased my book physically from me and then of course kindly asked for a signature, I'll always write three words on that opening page and those three words are keep it simple. It is one of my core trading beliefs and that is simplicity in trading really does work. And of course, that has flowed on very much into my add-on, my official add-on now in its sort of second um, reiteration or second sort of release with Metastock, my trade launch systems. It is a very, very straightforward, simple approaches and techniques. Um, I'm, I'm going to share some of the things with you today. Um, I'm actually going to be quite open and uh, I mean in some cases the formulas are so straightforward I could even give you some of those as well. I know Hunter will probably step in if I start giving absolutely everything away but I am going to be quite open today and, and share with you a number of the techniques that are incorporated in some of the systems and then of course with uh, the release of Trade Launch Systems 2.0 or 2.0 um, I've added another complete sort of little suite of uh, strategies and I'm going to share with you uh, what they're trying to achieve and show you some examples as well. So even if you don't go ahead with the add-on, it just gives you a, perhaps another idea for you to go away and sort of validate and prove or disprove and see if you can incorporate that into your own trading. At the end of the day, as I, as I said, I think people know too much and it's then a very difficult process for them to squeeze it in and narrow it down to a very clearly defined set of trading rules that they're going to uh, implement or execute with some confidence. So keep it simple is very much one of my core beliefs. I was going to start the session with all of my beliefs and run through but it's a lot of theory and there's a, I do have some PowerPoint slides ready to go but I thought look if I have time available at the end I'm more than happy to run through those. I thought I'd just get straight in to the actual practical and some of the techniques that I use. Okay, one of the first things I use, and this is part of the altitude trading system, which is uh, certainly more of a medium term conservative approach. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I've been using this or some semblance of it uh, for the last 15, one, five years, and I use it in my own retirement fund. We call that our self-managed superannuation fund here in Australia. But I use it for my own retirement fund for looking for stocks that are moving well in good, solid, medium-term uptrends. One of the techniques I use for my altitude system is a concept I call volatility percentage. Volatility percentage. And hopefully you're now, uh, I'm going to now start looking at the chart. The chart I have here of is an Australian index, market index of uh, 500 companies. It's called the All Ordinaries Index. And at the top of this chart, there is a single red line. That single red line is my volatility percentage indicator. And it is certainly part of the uh, trade launch systems. It's a very simple formula. I'm certainly happy to share this with you. There it is there under um, the drop down menu there, volatility percentage. And all I'm doing is, of course, tracking. Um, not every day, but over time, tracking the volatility using a very favourite indicator of mine, average true range, ATR, uh, using average true range and taking the average true range value um, as a percentage of the value of the product, whether it be the stock or the index, and then of course converting that to a percentage. So you can see now on average that the index at the moment, right hand edge of chart, is moving roughly around 1% per day. 
I have this also on the US S&P 500 index, again a little bit lower than that, probably around the 0 0.8, uh, 0.75 as you can see percent per day and the Dow Jones at the moment is also a similar level, maybe just a fraction lower. But what I've done over time is I thought about times when the indices really around the world, when things get a little bit crazy, they all tend to do the same thing. When the volatility of these indices exceeds a certain level, maybe it's time for me to just step aside and step out and leave the market to do its own thing and be silly and let me come back in a few weeks time when it's settled down. So simply through observation, I was able to, to come up with this sort of benchmark or level here of 1.5%. And you can see now that I've zoomed out a little bit and the other indices, the US ones there are very, very similar, that for the most significant amount of time, uh, the value of the volatility percentage remains below that 1.5. But there are times, and you can certainly see through 2008, when the index volatility exceeds that level and in some cases, as you can see, exceeds it by some margin. Um, if I even go to the Dow Jones and just zoom out a little bit, clearly 2008 was um, an excessive reading. But this was a time when the market, even early on in 2008, you could see the volatility exceeding that level. And that may be a time for some people just to step aside and say, this is crazy. Now it's all very well and good uh, you know, the Dow Jones up here, highest reading is just roughly, you know, over five and a half percent. It's all very well and good for individual stocks to have that level of volatility because many do. But when a broad brush market index has that level of volatility and over time, not just one day, then that's really out of the ordinary and it is uh, quite significant. And it's certainly worth perhaps stepping aside, but that's just more of a risk management thing over the bigger picture. I also use this individually for stocks. So, and I'll just come in here. I did some scans quickly before we started uh, today. So what I've done here is done a scan using my volatility percentage uh, explorer. And again, uh, this will be in the uh, add-on. If it's not, please let me know and I'll send it to you. It's, uh, it's not a very complicated formula. And what I'm able to do here is quickly scan the top 500 stocks from the US S&P 500. And uh, you know, by default, they come in alphabetical order in the Explorer report. However, this first column is actually the volatility percentage. And if I now rearrange them in order, we can see the lowest volatility stock is still a little bit more than 1%. And in the top 500 companies, they go all the way up to just under 10. However, that's a bit extreme because if I just come down a couple, all of a sudden now we're below six. So. Basically, all the stocks within the US S&P 500 are between 1% and 6% on this volatility percentage. And if I come down not very far, all of a sudden I'm below 4 So really, uh, a fair percentage are between 1% and 4 But we can use this information to almost categorise individual stocks and place our own volatility uh, parameter or criterion on an individual stock that we may be interested in at both ends. For example, we could say we don't want to see a stock whose volatility percentage is less than, and I'm just picking a number here, less than 1.5, less than 2, less than 1.3. It's not moving enough. There are far more volatile stocks out there. I don't want stocks that are moving you know, below the average. But at the same time, maybe I don't want stocks that are moving excessively and more than 3 or 4 or 5 or X, whatever X may be for your own comfort level. Remember, this is not a day-by-day -day proposition. Average true range is taking it over a period of time in, in uh, terms of months to get a much overall sort of smoother indication of the volatility of individual stocks. Anyway, it's just something worth considering. It's certainly in my altitude scan uh, off the top of my head, I don't want anything below 1.5% and I don't want anything more than 5%. Now, those numbers are mine. You don't have to use them, but it's just the idea and perhaps just massage those uh, numbers for your own use. But that's certainly uh, one of the things that I use. It's a big part of the scanning for more the altitude, more of the medium term conservative. For the ignition system within uh, trade launch, uh, it's a much more aggressive uh, shorter term system and I don't have any volatility uh, checks uh, within that. Another thing that I do as well, um, if I just 
just wait for this. Another thing that I do, oops, my screen is just. Another thing I check as well is all time highs and all time lows. Uh, again, just almost as a market breadth tool. You know, people use advanced decline lines and all sorts of measures of uh, market breadth. And one of the things that I do every week is just check the number of stocks that have achieved an all-time high in the last week and those that have achieved an all-time low. It makes for interesting reading um, and I often compare the numbers and it's sort of a, a, another different way of getting an idea of the market sort of breadth and the way the market is performing um, simply by seeing the number of stocks and clearly when we have so many more achieving all-time lows and that tells me something uh, that maybe the market is not so healthy, often it's reflected in the index anyway, but um, just an interesting thing uh, to look at. <clears throat> one of the things, uh, one of the stocks I was going to look at uh, just to show some examples of uh, altitude and also ignition and some of the tools that are in there, and I certainly will get to the uh, my slingshot systems, which is the new component in Trade Launch. Um, this is a particular stock. It's listed on the Australian Securities Exchange. It is currently trading at an all-time high, or has in the last week, as you can see, um, just in this last uh, 12 months. <clears throat> Excuse me. And generally speaking, these are the stocks that I'm absolutely interested in, which with altitude, the more medium-term you know, well-established uh, trends and the like. And one of the components, and I know you've, you've probably seen this before, but this has been a huge part of what I've done. Whoops, I'll just cancel that for a sec. This has been a huge part of my own trading with these sorts of stocks for a long time, certainly uh, at least 15 years as I can remember. And that's having a trailing exit uh, for these well-established uh, uptrends. So as part of, definitely as part of the, the altitude and trade launch systems, is this trailing ATR stop for long and short. Um, the idea being, and I'm just going to randomly pick a low point here, so that's the 2nd of June, might, look, might read as the 6th of February for some of you, but it's uh, to me it's the 2nd of June, and I'll just put on my trailing ATR stop there, and I'll in fact put in the 2nd of June and use a 4 multiple. ATR, and then I now have, and hopefully you can see that okay, I'll just make that a bit uh, thicker there for you. So now we have what's known as my trailing ATR exit for my altitude system. Um, this does an extraordinarily good job of staying far enough away from price to allow good solid uptrends to continue, and of course downtrends as well, um, but not being too close to price. Now this is very much suited to altitude, not ignition. Ignition is a much shorter term system and I cannot see under any circumstances you using ignition system and being in a trade this long. Altitude, absolutely it's going to happen often when stocks do move well. The key parameter with this is simply the multiple of the average true range we are going to use. So you would have noticed as I place this on, I've selected a multiple of four. What this means is at any point in time, we are taking the average true range value of the individual stock to which this exit is being applied to. And in this particular case, I'm just going to do some rough math that it's probably in the order of 11 or 12 cents. And it's using that 11 or 12 cents and multiplying it by this number here to establish a distance between the, the most recent high price and the exit. Right, that's why you'll see throughout here it's roughly around 40 cents, which is why I guess it's probably in the order of 11 or 12 uh, cents. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we narrow, if we make this number smaller, then clearly that uh, indicator is just going to creep in a little bit closer because all of a sudden now I'm not multiplying the average true range value by four, it's only three, and we're a little bit closer. And as I shared with a live audience, I spoke with. Uh, uh, just the other night here in Melbourne. Um, many, many years ago when I started using this, I used to use 3 ATR all the time and it was very, very effective and slowly but surely I started to learn that it wasn't as effective anymore. So it's all of a sudden quite a number of years ago now in the order of um, maybe six, seven years ago, I actually started using a multiple of four. Um, which is what I now still use today, which of course pushes it out just far enough and it does it, as you can see, a very, very effective job of staying far enough away from price to allow price to do its own thing. Um, trailing exits to me in stocks are 
very, very useful. Um, you know, in currency trading, people use a lot of you know stop losses and targets or profit targets or take profit levels, uh, which is fine. Um, but I think stocks who can get on you know extended runs, um, I think trailing exits are far more suited uh, to stocks. So that's certainly a big component with ignition because it's such a shorter term system. I don't suggest people use such a wide um, a wide stop. And in the manual, it's very clearly explained how, in fact, I do suggest uh, exiting with ignition. And it's a very much a more narrow focus on individual bars and. Um, because it's rare that you would be in an ignition trade for any more than two weeks on a daily chart. So uh, certainly an exit of this nature is not well suited to such a shorter term uh, trading system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the interesting things that I do present to people, and really just to prove the effectiveness and value of having such a simple exit strategy, um, and one of the things that I also often say is, you know, again with my three girls, you know, it's not as effective anymore because they're now a little bit older <laughs> than when I used to start explaining this particular technique. But I used to say that, you know, give me 60 seconds and I could explain to my youngest daughter how to implement this exit strategy because that's how simple it is. Give me 60 seconds. I wouldn't even have to explain that it's a company or it's a public company or what a company is. I could just tell her, see those red and green things, they represent price. You know, it's using a scale on the right, don't worry about scales, you'll learn that in year X at school, okay? But just be mindful that that's the price. And all you need to do, my beautiful child, is just look at that red line. And if at any point in time the price, see that red and green stuff, comes down and moves through that red line, I want you to tell me. I want you to come and tell me. I could even go as far as, as talking about the close and the little dash on the right hand side and just saying if that remains above the red line then don't bother. Um, don't, don't tell me it's okay, uh, wait till the next day. It can be that simple to execute and when we sort of realise such an important decision that this in fact is uh, to get out of our trades and having such a, a simple but a very powerful technique can be incredibly valuable. Some people refer to this as a chandelier exit, you'll certainly see reference uh, to that as well. You wouldn't believe it, just this last week I thought, why do people call it chandelier? And I of course did a quick little search on the Google machine and thought it might have been a Frenchman named after someone in France or something and his name was Jean-Francois Chandelier or something like that, but of course it wasn't so uh, elaborate as that. It was just simply a reference to a chandelier being a large light fixture, you know, in the centre of a room. And guess what chandeliers used to do? They used to hold up candles. Um, so of course this exit uh, theoretically is holding up a candle or holding up candles. So for what that's worth, that's uh, I did a bit of research to find out why people also refer to it as, as a chandelier exit. But that's effectively uh, what it is. And clearly, uh, the the smaller time frame we use here. Uh, we're now just sort of strangling the price and we're certainly not going to be able to take advantage of any well-established sort of uh, move. Now the volatility of this particular stock, again, I can access my volatility percentage uh, indicator up here, even just place it on the same window as the, the price and I don't need the scale, I'm just going to hover over the value here and I can see that it's currently a little bit over 3%. So it's been a you know, reasonably volatile stock, you know, moving over 3% on average every day, but you can see it has been a reasonably steady performer and a good move, um, a good stock that has just steadily moved a bit higher. Another thing that I often uh, share with people, again, very related to uh, very related to that particular indicator is, a, is stocks that have achieved significant gain. So I did a, a quick search, uh, again, just of the Australian market top 500 stocks. And just to share with you actually, before I do that, for those who are not in Australia, um, just come back to, you know, actually I'll just show you the S&P 500 for a second. What I did notice also is these volatility uh, surges, I'll come into the Dow Jones, when we see surges in volatility in an index, and again just using my own measure here of moving through that black line, it's amazing how often it occurs when prices are falling, when the index is falling. Um, generally, uh, when we see a surge in volatility, it's because the market has fallen sharply. Here it is again, moving up, market falling, 
up, up, up markets all falling. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, but it is good, I think, and reassuring sometimes to see what we believe to be true actually represented by data and actually seeing it graphically on a chart and certainly through 2008 excessive volatility and we know what the market did and even more recently this is a few years ago now again surges in volatility and we're seeing the market fall very very sharply all these times here so I found that quite interesting that anytime we do move beyond those sort of thresholds it's because the market um, is actually falling quite sharply. Just for those not familiar with the Australian market, I know the Dow Jones and S&P 500 are, are at or pretty close to record highs. Just to give you an idea, the Australian market is not. Um, and if we come back to, this is sort of pre-GFC levels, almost near 7,000, and we're still a long way short of that. And interestingly enough, despite the US indices being as high as they are, the Australian market since the beginning of the year has only really moved around four or five percent, and that's it. So one of the things that I share with people is this large gain, is that again, I just have a scan for this. And again, I just need to be patient and make sure it all feeds through to all of your screens. Um, and what I do here just as a search, and again, the, this formula is so straightforward, please contact me or Metastock and get it off me. It's, uh, it's not part of the add-on, but it's just uh, an interesting learning tool to come back to the effectiveness of the trailing ATR exit that I use. And what I do here is these are all stocks in Australia, and if there is a one in the first column, and the column heading is 100 to 200, if there is a one in that column, which is all those stocks and all those stocks there, um, that one represents that over the last 12 months that stock has moved between 1 and 200% higher, right? between 100% and 200%. If there is a 1 in the column here, but the 2 to 300, which is those five stocks there, they have moved between 200 and 300. These here are the 300 to 400, and would you believe it, there's even four that have moved more than 400% in the last 12 months. And this is a market that has struggled to move 5%. And yet there are so many stocks that have had excessive, very, very strong, healthy moves. And these are all big companies. They're all in the top 500 out of roughly 2,000. So they're all reasonable size companies and they all move very well. And of course, often when we are talking techniques and strategies, people will ask, hey Stuart, that's terrific, but how do we find those stocks? How do we develop a scan within Metastock to find those stocks? Well, it's a fair question, isn't it? And a fairly a reasonable question and a question that I can relate to. How do we find those stocks? The reality is, as I just come back to this one that's moving quite well, the reality is you don't find them. The reality is you can't find them. Um, the reality is that when you enter a trade, whether it be stocks, a currency, anything, when you enter a trade, you have zero idea where that price is going to go. Zero. You have no idea. We have expectation, we have probability, we have expected outcome, but the reality is we have zero idea where it's going. You cannot possibly plan and try to scan for something that is going to move up 200% in the next 12 months. The question is not how do you find them. The focus and therefore the question should be on, hey Stuart, if I am lucky enough to stumble across a stock that is going to move like this, what sort of risk management rules and what sort of exit strategy could I have in place and how would I develop my own discipline and patience to ensure that if a stock did move 200% that I in fact still owned it at the end of that move, that I in fact didn't get out after two weeks because it made 8%, that I in fact was still in the trade. How can I have a risk management model or a set of rules or an exit strategy that will allow me to stay in that trade and really enjoy one of those sort of trades um, that almost makes your year. And then I come back to this simple red line on this chart and indicate it can be something as simple as this. And this is why I love Metastock so much. It is the number crunching, it's the exploring, it's the scanning, it's doing all this analysis and, and crunching of data. But it's also having all these systems set up in one place 
that eventually, and you know what, we all have so many options available to us for trading platforms, you know, execution platforms, analysis software. We have so many options available to us, but if it ain't broke, I'm not going to try and fix it. And that's why I've, you know, that's why I've stuck with Metastock for as long as I have, because over time you build up this sort of library of different ideas and concepts, and things are all just working for you, and that's all you need. You need things like this and techniques that you develop confidence in, and obviously then can use. All right, I need to move on, start talking about a few other techniques. Uh, look, if there's any questions, uh, I don't know if I have access to a chat or a questions window, but certainly uh, if I see any, I'll uh, do my very best to answer them. Uh, I hope you're all enjoying it. Please feel free to ask some questions, and I'll certainly at the end, we'll try to find some time for me to squeeze out some specific responses to your questions. Another thing I do, um, again, this is all part of uh, altitude, and then I'll move on to the slingshot system very soon, is what I try to do is I form brackets. And let's just go back the last sort of uh, six months. So this will be a six month bracket that I draw. Again, the formula for this is really quite straightforward. It's just more the concept I'm sharing with you. And what I'll do is I'll take a bracket over the last sort of, uh, whoops, I'm gonna get rid of the crosshairs and draw a line over the last six months, and I'll identify the highest point in the last six months and the lowest point. And this is all done with the formulas, it's all done with the language, it's all part of altitude. And when I'm gonna, over the last six months, I form a bracket, it's almost like a stochastic oscillator, because that's effectively what it is, it's just over a lot shorter term, but this is over six months. And I now have a bracket of the lowest price and the highest in the last six months, and I now am able to scale this between zero to 100. I can now appoint a value between 0 and 100 for every single price here. And I take the most recent price, which would be the close right here, and get its value between 0 down here and 100 up here. I can now set a criterion or a rule for that particular value. And if I want something in a well-established trend, and this is just one of many components, but this is one, would I want the current price to be somewhere near zero or 10 or 20 of where it has been in the last six months? Or do you think I'd prefer it to be up near 75 or 80 or 90? I don't want it to be 100 because then I'm looking for it to be at the high. I think we can be a little bit more flexible than that, but I can certainly set a criterion that I want it to be maybe more than 80% or 80. So that's a rule now and I have a very simple, not sure if you can see it here, there it is, six month bracket and three month bracket. So it does that simple calculation. It takes the current price and now I can set a criterion when I'm conducting my exploration and say, I want that value to be more than X or less than Y. If we trade a different technique and we're trading a little bit shorter term, well, we don't make it a six month bracket. We make it a six day bracket or a two week bracket. And maybe we're looking for a, re a retracement. So to go long, we may want a low value because we're looking for a reversal or a bounce and we combine that with another technique. So that's another thing I use. I'll get rid of all these lines quickly. Another thing that I use, or again, part of altitude, I'll just get rid of um, that one as well, is called volume strength. I'll do two more things quickly and then I'll get onto the slingshot system. Uh, volume strength, again, it's a technique I use in altitude. It's certainly one of the indicators. And what I do is, just bring that uh, down here, what I do is I look, you know, I used to think volume every day was important and then I realise with ignition, with a shorter term system, it may very well be, but with more of a longer term system, I don't think measuring volume every single day and trying to see an increase all the time is perhaps that practical. So what I try to do is look at a bigger picture and if I see a stock that is moving in a well established uptrend, I do wish to see generally an increase in volume. I, I definitely do want to see that. Uh, now we can track turnover as well, uh, or volume, but of course as price goes up, generally turnover or activity is going to increase as well, or that's sort of the dollar amount traded. And what I do here, again, sharing with you, and Hunter, you need to step in if I'm sharing too much here, but um, what I do is I take the volume average over the last two months, let's just say that's there, so the volume over the last two months, and I compare it to the three months before. So the two months now of what I'm seeing with the real move and I'm really interested in getting involved, I compare the volume over the last two months to the three months before that and do you think I want to see it exactly the same or you know, an increase or a decrease? 
Generally speaking, I'd like to see an increase because often when prices go on these large up moves, there has been a period of consolidation or sideways movement before then and we generally see a decrease in volume during those times and when we start to see you know, a new sort of large long term trend established and start to trade, we generally do see an increase in volume and that's exactly what I do want to see. So this value here, I want to see it over 100 and sure enough at the moment it is 132, so that's pretty healthy. It's not excessive, but it's certainly showing that the volume recently has been greater than what it has been before. So that's one thing and I'll do one more technique and this is in the existing uh, add-on, I'll just get rid of some of these lines here. And this again is very important for having data-driven decisions, which is one of my core beliefs. And that is in the expert advisor, and I'm sure a lot of you as Metastock users would know about the, you know, the commentary available, what's commentary available in the expert advisor within Metastock. And this is all part of the add-on, as you can see here, the altitude system. The other systems also have um, their own commentary as well. But this is allowing for data-driven decisions. This is allowing us to have information that is critical to the decisions we make and for execution and actually getting into these trades. But more importantly for me here, it's the actual, excuse me, the mathematical calculation of very important risk management. Things like stop losses and our size of our trade, how many stock or shares we're going to trade. So to have something like the commentary doing all the mathematical calculations for you, I think is Fantastic, I've had this set up for a long time now. And you know, to be open with you, um, I used to do all of these calculations in Excel, Microsoft Excel. I'd put in a few numbers in Excel and it would do all the calculations for me. It would determine whether it was exceeding my maximum trade size and all sorts of things that I used to do in Excel. I'm sure I have a copy of that spreadsheet somewhere still. But now, of course, with the commentary, um, I've got it all set up in there. And this is all part of the altitude system as well. So again, it's all a part of moving towards having data drive your decisions. Uh, not a matter of just sort of randomly trading or indiscriminately looking for opportunities or using all of those technical analysis techniques that we've learned about and trying to look for opportunities for every single one of them, which is bordering on impossible. Just having a clearly defined set of rules and a technique and, and um, you know, risk management rules like that and having all of these systems set up so it makes our decision making far more streamlined and efficient. It lends itself towards consistency, which is another one of my core beliefs and that is doing the same things over and over again, just like a casino does. Casinos do that and they do very, very well and I absolutely believe there are applications to trading and you know, sticking to probability and doing things over and over again uh, the same. Uh, I think there's tremendous application and value in doing that with our trading. So that's another one of my core beliefs. So I've given you a few of them. Keep it simple. Have data-driven decisions. Aim for consistency. Keep it simple. These are all some of my uh, beliefs. Anyway, the last thing I wanted to share with you, and this is uh, new with uh, the add-on again. I've just done a quick search and I found uh, stock and I just of course, you wouldn't expect anything less. It is, it's not quite a textbook example, but it certainly does a reasonable job of explaining um, uh, what I'm trying to do here. And that is, you know, these moving averages are an 8 and a 21 moving average. They do a very, very good job, and you should see this applied to currencies. Uh, it does, I think, even a better job. Um, these moving averages do a reasonable job of capturing price. Now, just bear with me as I sort of scroll back and forward here. And when prices do trend, they do in fact uh, move. You know, even in the strongest of downtrends, you don't get four or five hundred red candles in a row. You just never see that. There's always little retracements against the trend, even in the strongest of trends. You don't get four or five hundred green candles in a row. That just never ever happens. You always get counter trend rallies. Always. And this slingshot system is simply identifying times when they're giving you an opportunity to get into those well-established trends. So yes, I'm using moving averages to identify a trend and we can measure the strength of that trend by you know, the degree of movement and momentum in the moving average, all sorts of mathematical criterion that within the Metastock language are very straightforward to set up. And you'll notice that, you know, let's just take this example here, that when price moves lower, this sort of red moving average here does a reasonable job as literally just sitting on price on top of it. It's almost acting like dynamic or moving resistance. 
And then when price does rally reasonably well, it comes back up into an area here, which I consider like an opportunity zone. It's like a, uh, an execution zone where it's giving us an opportunity in a weakness in a well-established trend. So that's all I'm looking for here is movements back within this zone and then movements back in, uh, sorry, movements back out to get into the established trend. That's all I'm looking to do. Um, so effectively, we often see, again, I'm just sort of moving back and forward here. Let's just go to recent sort of time here. We'll look at some ups. So, you know, this has been a strong uptrend to start the first six months of this year. And all we're looking for is when price, you know, here it is here, great example of literally just sitting on top of this red line. Look at it. It's almost as if everybody knows the red line is there. It moves back into this zone and potentially gives us another opportunity to enter that existing trend. It's just like it has here, it's moved up strongly. It's come back again, given us another opportunity, come back again, given us another opportunity and another opportunity. So that's all we're looking to do is to trade in established trends but all we're looking to do is give us opportunities or signals uh, to do just that. The reality is with any scans and with any system, you know, we all know within Metastock we have the Explorer and you know, the slingshot systems I've got set up down here somewhere under TLS, the trade launch system. Um, you know, any scan you do, ideally we don't want too many opportunities being presented to us, but generally speaking, we'll have more than is practical for us to actually trade. So the great thing is rather than us looking through 500 stocks, looking to apply this sort of technique or strategy, we may only have five or eight, but then it's highly likely you are not going to trade all five or eight. But at least we're not looking at 500 charts, we're only looking at five. So we then still have that discretion to look at each individual opportunity and apply our own parameters in the sense of, look, is that strength Sorry, is that trend strong? Is it too flat for me? Is it doing this? Is the volume strength, you know, from that other strategy perhaps not really, uh, you know, supporting this down move? All sorts of other things or parameters that we can uh, apply to this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that's really the position that we need to get into. And you know, I looked uh, here before, generally I, and I haven't done it with this, generally all the explorers within Metastock, and please excuse me for saying this, Hunter, but all the explorers within Metastock, I generally delete them all. Um, you'll notice my drop down menu here basically doesn't have all the other indicators of, of which there are hundreds. Uh, it doesn't have them. Uh, I, I actually access the quick list properties and remove them all because I don't need them, I don't want them. Um, yes, I have a few up here like average through range and moving average to use, but all the rest are mine. And I think, you know, we all need to move to that level where we don't have 600 indicators in our drop down or quick list menu and we don't have 400 explorers sitting in um, in our Explorer, uh, yes, it's good to have them at some point, but I also believe at some point it's really good to eliminate and remove a lot of those and just have the things that we use and have confidence in and implement on a regular basis and do well out of. And if that's my trade launch systems as a, as a starting point, then I'll be happy and I hope you'll be happy too. But again, I think we need to move towards not having you know, too many techniques or strategies, but really narrowing our focus down to just one or two that we understand very, very well and can implement with a great deal of confidence. So I think that's certainly very, very important, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, all of these things uh, that I've shown you, so effectively now Trade Launch Systems add-on has four different strategies. Um, Two of them I've been using for a very long time, that is Altitude and Ignition, and they were part of the original uh, add-on release last year. Slingshot is something I've been working on the last 12 months or so, and the fourth is the Reversal Signals, which is also a part of the original. So the Slingshot is the sort of latest addition that I've been working on and testing. But again, and I'll be incredibly open with you, uh, just because I think they work or tell you that they work, please don't believe me. And I, see that, I say that quite sincerely. It's your money you're putting at risk, not mine. So it's important for you to validate, to prove or disprove uh, that they can work for you or in fact they're not going to work for you. I think they work. I think they can be quite simple yet very, very effective. 
but it's your money being put at risk, not mine. So please do your own research and do your own validation um, because you're the one that needs to have that comfort and confidence level in executing it. So that's just a little bit of me, sort of a bit more of a philosophy sort of rambling about trading. But I think that's very, very important because it is your money and not mine. Anyway, I don't uh, have a, a huge amount more to talk about. Um, as I said, some of these systems I've been using for a long time. Altitude I really started developing in 2000, 2001 and again to be very open with you, that's because after the NASDAQ crashed I had no more money left in my account um, and I went back to study basically and did a lot of research and testing and proving or disproving because my account balance in my trading account had been emptied. So I did have a lot of time and that was really the, the beginning of my altitude system and developing a more medium term conservative approach and ignition then came along as a bit more of a shorter term system which I very actively use in my currency trading. Uh, not so much my stock trading but again that's just my personal choice, not because it doesn't work. Um, I more active trading is in currencies and I certainly use Ignition system for that um, and then a couple of these other systems uh, in there as well. Hunter, I'm not really sure if there's been any questions uh, come through. If there has, um, um, perhaps you can direct me to them but uh, I'm more than certainly happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. I'm certainly not wanting to keep you longer than we've committed to. Um, I'm sure you have other things you need to get on with. Um, but I'm more than happy to take any questions uh, at this stage and certainly if you have any specific questions, I have Metastock up here and running ready to go um, just to help you out and, and respond to that question. Um, yeah, not so, much more as I said. The Sorry, you go ahead Hunter, I beg your pardon. Yeah, no, no worries Stuart. Um, I'll throw out a couple of uh, questions that we've gotten so far. Um, do you trade options and also does this add-on have anything to do with position size and money management? Now I got the first question, do I trade options? What was the second part please? Uh, the second part is does the add-on have anything to do with position sizing and money management? Yeah, so the first uh, question, I don't trade options. I did have a little dabble back in 1999 or 2001, something like that. Um, I don't, I stopped trading them a long time ago. I know a lot of people do, I really have no objection to them. Uh, at that time I moved on to warrants and of course more recently uh, moved on to a product which I know is not available in the US and that's called a contract for difference or CFD. The question about risk management, look, uh, the commentary as I said here in the altitude system uh, very much has uh, risk management calculations within the commentary. Uh, Ignition has something similar where it actually provides data and information important for the analysis and the decision that you make with Ignition. But certainly with Altitude, uh, there's quite a, an extensive uh, commentary here and all of these parameters here can be set in other indicators that come part of the add-on as part of the trade launch system. So. In actual fact, we would go to the indicator builder and edit those settings and all of this is in the manual of course and all of that information is then used in calculation of all these you know, position sizing and risk management calculations. So yes, uh, to answer that question. Okay. Uh, does the four times trailing ATR work on Forex 2 or do you have a different approach to your stocks with Forex? That's a great question. Uh, it doesn't work very well, no. Um, look, the 4 ATR I think is just, uh, I, I guess it comes down to how you trade currencies, but I don't know of anybody who trades currencies and would hold a position for months. Uh, you just don't see that in FX. So uh, even me, I'm reasonably conservative with uh, currencies. My average hold time is somewhere between one or two weeks, which is quite conservative for a lot of currency traders. Uh, I do use another technique. I actually do use trailing exits within currencies. A lot of people just use stop loss and take profit levels. They just have one. They'll set you know, the take profit at two times the distance of the stop, you know, 50 pips or 100 or whatever it might be. Because of all my experience with using trailing stops in stocks, I actually brought that over to currencies and use both. I do have another technique. It is as part of the ignition system, it is in the manual. It's really just following the lows of the previous period uh, for a long and, and following down the highs from the previous period in short positions. It's a lot closer to, uh, a lot closer to price, 
but it is effectively a trailing exit and not a take profit or target. And last question it looks like we have here is, please tell me about your trading checklist. Do you write it down and refer back to it uh, after exit or review it in a journal? Yeah, one of the, I uh, said I, I didn't want to go to PowerPoint. I'll just do it once if that's okay and hopefully that comes through on your screen. This is one of the slides I was going to show. Uh, this is a trading process that I really try to impart to people and even those who have been trading for some time, this provides some framework and it's a logical step by step uh, you know, uh, sequence and you can read through all that and think well there's nothing new there, I know all that, but all this does is puts it in a logical sequence. So this effectively is a checklist and I have, I'm a lists person, I have a list for everything um, and you know, as I say to people, I never forget things because they're always on my list. So I think it's very much a personal choice, but if you're in a position where you think it is important that you do have a list just to check off as you are going through your decision making, then I am all for that. I mean, I'm a huge believer in having a list, checklists, you know, I came from an organisation where checklists and double checks were always critical because you couldn't afford to have a lapse and have a, an error and I think there's an application here. So that's the logical sequence that I try to teach people. Step seven looks like it's silly but it's, uh, it's not, it is there for a reason that it is. Once your trades are on the platform and have been executed, go away and do something else and let trades run their course. But yes to that question, yes I do believe in having checklists and I do certainly use them. I'm glad you had that PowerPoint, just right on tap for that question. R right there, yes. <laughs> Um, another question on that FX stop, uh, were you describing the lowest low stop method? Um, yeah, I think I uh, got that question. Yeah, so depending on your time frame, whether you use a daily chart or four hours or one hour, all I'm doing for a long trade, and again this is in the manual for the trade launch systems for ignition, all I'm doing uh, for a long trade is yes, taking the low of the previous uh, period, previous bar or candle and just taking literally a few pips below that and that's my exit for the next period whether it be a four hour or a day and then if the low is high which is going to be otherwise it would have triggered the loss at the stop then I'm just going to move it up as each period uh, unfolds. It, it is that straightforward, uh, it's very simple, it's a very simple trailing and essentially as, as price continues to move in your direction this trailing exit will just be there ready to catch it when it doesn't. It, it's that simple. Okay, wonderful. Well, I, I, I think that that's uh, pretty much all the questions that we have. Um, again, we, we will actually stay around here for uh, a couple of minutes just in case uh, any other questions uh, do come in. Uh, one thing I did want to list here, uh, those of you who uh, are looking at the actual trade launch systems. Uh, the, the second iteration of, of uh, trade launch systems, which actually last year was our number one selling add-on. Uh, the second version of this actually is, is coming with the entire slingshot system that comes with six indicators, two explorations, uh, one expert advisor, and of course one template. Uh, the system as a whole it is a very, very powerful system. Everybody that, uh, that has used it, that I've spoken to, really, really likes it because it is very, very simple. It takes a lot of information and it crams it into a very, very simple system to read and use. And I think Stuart's done a wonderful job in creating a system that is simple enough that, like you were saying, he can, he can show a child how to trade. Uh, just based off a of very simple signal. So it works very, very well. Uh, now, one thing that we want to do for the individuals that uh, have attended this webinar is, is to give you uh, a little bit of a discount, a little bit of a promotion on the uh, trade launch systems. So normally the pricing for it is $4.99. For individuals that are in this webinar, we will take $100 off of that price, so it will be $3.99. Uh, and that is only for people that are in the webinar currently. Now to order this, there's a, a few different ways. 
we actually, it's a little bit late in the evening here. It's about 7 o'clock in the evening, so most of our reps have uh, gone home. But you can just shoot me an email directly. You can give us a call tomorrow at the same time. You just mentioned that you were in the webinar with Stuart. Uh, you can chat in, or you can contact Stuart directly. Uh, his website is listed right there. Uh, either organization, either Metastock or, 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 or Stuart, we're always happy to answer questions. Uh, Stuart has some of the, the best education uh, in the industry. So please let us know if you have any questions. Stuart, again, thank you so much for doing this webinar for us. It's always a pleasure having you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, like I said, we'll stick around for a couple more minutes. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to type them in the box and we'll answer it. Otherwise, uh, thank you for joining this webinar this evening, and as always, happy training.